for those of you who don't know me, my name is Taylor Wyatt and I'm the Education Coordinator at Omaha Performing Arts. Um, and I just wanna thank you again for joining us for our first digital workshop, which is a virtual tour of the Orpheum Theater and a Q&A of non-performance careers in the arts. I'm gonna go ahead and turn it over to Bill Grennan, who's our Education Manager, and Ryan Murray, who's our Production Manager, and they will get started. Hello, everybody. I think uh, Taylor is going to kind of make sure everyone knows what they need to know and see what they need to see. Uh, again, for this meeting, uh, if you go to the top uh, right corner of your screen, you can go from gallery view to speaker view. And when you go to speaker view, it should just be able to kind of spotlight this specific video. And uh, it's going to be uh, that way you get like the full screen experience that kind of goes forward from there. Uh, we want to welcome everybody that is tuning in right now. Uh, this is kind of our first time doing this. My name is Bill Grennan. I am the uh, Education Manager at Omaha Performing Arts. My name is Ryan Murray. I am the Production Manager for Omaha Performing Arts. And I believe that we have folks joining us from all over the state of Nebraska. Uh, Nebraska High School Theater Academy participants and otherwise. I saw signups from West Point Beamer, I saw them from Ainsworth, I saw them from Shadron, I saw them from all over the place. So uh, you just let us know in the chat when you're talking to Taylor, you know, where it is that you're tuning in from, because we really appreciate you joining us here for this. So what we're going to do is kind of showcase different parts of the Orpheum Theater and also talk about uh, the different types of people that work in those areas to kind of highlight non-performance careers in the arts. We'll also have little bits of trivia about the space as well. And uh, you can feel free to ask any questions. And throughout uh, the time that we are gonna be broadcasting with you, Taylor will ask us some specific questions so that we can answer any of them that you might have, especially about non-performance careers in the arts and about the cool things that you see in the Orpheum. So again, if you are just joining us, just make sure in the top right corner of your screen, you go from gallery view to speaker view, and then you should be able to uh, just kind of focus on the one video that you see right here. Uh, I'm just going to make one quick adjustment of my camera setup and systems and make sure that we are good to go from there. Perfect. Awesome. Hi. Wave to the people, right? There we go. Perfect. Um, so we will start off by simply kind of pointing out uh, the space that we are currently in, which is one of the lobbies. Um, the lobby in specifically that we're going to start in is right here. Uh, you kind of saw some of you when I was first just kind of joining in was uh, the exhibition lobby is what this is called. Uh, it's one of the relatively newer parts of the building, if I'm not mistaken, right? Correct. It, this actually used to be uh, a bank lobby uh, and then it got converted into the Orpheum lobby. Absolutely. And then when you, so this is a spot, of course, when patrons first come in, they get their snacks, they get their beverages, whatever it is they need. And then we will make our way here, which is the Grand Lobby, and the Grand Lobby is this, uh, is an amazing piece of original architecture of the Orpheum Theater. It's a French Renaissance uh, style of lobby that you see right here. And the cool thing about everything from the chandeliers to the curtains that you see to, uh, you know, the metal that's on the walls as well. Uh, uh, Ryan, if I'm not mistaken, about 85% of this is still original to the building. That is correct, yeah. yes. And for those of you that might wonder, uh, the Orpheum Theater was built in 1927, which makes it almost 93 years old. Correct. Yeah. yeah. We just wanted to kind of start here and give you kind of a good look at the, uh, the, the lobby and entrance. And now we'll kind of make our way into the theater. Uh, at some points, you might see my connection drop out. Don't worry about that. The connection will come back in. And uh, Taylor can always kind of uh, fill in the gaps in between the spots. So Taylor, if you have any questions for the chat, you go ahead and do so. Hello again, everybody. Uh, right now, I don't have any questions, but I did want to remind everyone that if you have any questions during the tour, please go ahead and use the chat function. That way I can communicate with Bill and Ryan if anyone has any questions on specific aspects or parts of the Orpheum tour. So I think we're ready to move on to our next section. Great. Thank you, Taylor. So right now, Ryan, where are we? We are currently in the lighting and sound booth, which is in the back of the main hall at the Orpheum. So this is where um, the lighting and, and soundboard techs um, operate a show from. We are currently looking at the light board. Um, this is an ETC ion. Um, it's fairly com common and standard um, in theatrical houses. This is where um, a designer will come in along with the programmer and kind of um, from here, or we do have the ability to take the console out into the house and kind of program lights um, out there for, for a number of different shows. And then when we run the show, of course, we'll come back here 
um, behind all the patrons and kind of run it from back here. Yeah. So Ryan, a number of jobs that you would find back in this spot, you know, this is do the people that run this, you know, the board or the people that design the shows and all of that, uh, are those people that are normally a part of the tours that come in or uh, are they staff here at Omaha Performing Arts or are they a member of uh, another group of stagehands? Um, it kind of depends on the show. So um, if it's a Broadway show, for example, um, those shows don't travel with designers anymore because they're pretty well past the point of designing, but they'll send their crew with them on the touring shows and they'll work with the local stagehands that we have. Um, we have a house electrician, a house audio person, and a house carpenter who kind of work for the building to kind of coordinate um, those various departments with the touring shows. Um, there are some shows that don't travel with anybody, and they do rely more, most heavily on the local crew to um, either design it, to either um, implement um, paperwork that they provide us and kind of make the show happen. Every We encounter a little bit of everything from well packaged to you know, throwing it at us and we have to put it all together. Absolutely. You know, one of my favorite parts of uh, doing the Nebraska High School Theater Academy is when we do the showcase. And a lot of that time that we spend in the showcase is kind of working with, you know, members of the Omaha Performing Arts stage crew with members of IATSE to kind of just look at the light system and see what kind of cool show we can make. Whereas, you know, a Broadway tour like Hamilton, you know, they know what lights they need. They know what pieces they need. They can kind of sit down at this board, know exactly what to do. And the second that that tour comes in, they're off and rolling. Yeah. And that's uh, kind of the difference between um, producing a show and having a show on the road because you're at that point past the point of producing and you have it well packaged and it's uh, good to go. And so I noticed that there's a booth all the way down over there. And then mm -hmm. we have, of course, the booth that's over here, but there's a huge gap in between the two. So that gap is generally where the touring shows um, set up. So when the show comes in, like Broadway, for example, they come pretty well self-contained. So they'll come with their own lighting board, um, video board, uh, and their own audio console as well. So we kind of reserve the center section for them to set up. And a lot of times they utilize our own equipment and theirs. Um, so we kind of have our, our setups on the end and they kind of plug in um, to our setup so that it's kind of a seamless transition when we load in a show we, we uh, we're ready to go and so you can kind of see the 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 view of the orpheum from back here and then that gets us to the other console which is the soundboard yep so we move on to the other end um, this is our sound console it's a venue sc48 sound console um, so this is where we run our wireless microphones um, if we have any band in the orchestra for example uh, we'll amplify them mic them up and we'll run it from back here as well from the audio console now, how many mics could we operate at one time from back here? From back here on this console, 48. 48 microphones. Is there ever a time where you've had to do more than 48? I was about to say a little trivia um, on the showcase, which is the uh, Nebraska Theater Academy showcase. Fun fact is our largest that we kind of self-produce. And we have a little over 90 microphones in that um, production. That's right, over 90. So it takes a lot to kind of operate and do these things. Now, who uh, back here is operating this? Is operating this? Do we have audio engineers and other types of uh, people that work in that industry? Yep, so we have an audio engineer who kind of is mixing the show. It's called mixing the show. Um, so you take all the inputs from different microphones from the band, make sure that the sound levels are even and consistent um, throughout the whole room um, so that it just it sounds good for everybody. Absolutely. This is one of my favorite parts to kind of check out when we first come into uh, the Orpheum Theater. And one of my favorite things that we got to do, which was kind of look at uh, the booth and kind of see, because, you know, I, I mostly, you know, when I did theater, I was mostly a performer. But one of my favorite things that I got to do was participate in the backstage crew. I got to sound design. I got to be a board op. I got to, you know, be an assistant stage manager. And I encourage anyone that is, uh, for any students that are, you know, uh, watching this, you know, if you... Uh, right now are acting only, you know, you, you like to be on the stage and you like to perform on the stage. That's really awesome. But you get such an appreciation of what it takes to put a show together when you do kind of explore everything uh, that it takes to put on a show, explore all the different roles and all the different places to do. Ryan, when did you first start getting into kind of doing theater and working, you know, on the technical side of things? Uh, that would have been in high school. Um, actually, I got involved in my um, high school theater group producing shows and kind of got involved in the backstage side of things. Um, and then I also got involved in the Omaha Community Playhouse um, just as a backstage volunteer. Um, and I volunteered there throughout high school and throughout college, um, kind of working on different shows. I kind of got that theater bug uh, right away. And so I was kind of hooked. And then when I went to college, I um, 
continued with that and um, minored in theater and kind of uh, learned a lot more in depth about what it takes to put on different shows. Absolutely. So right now we are in the orchestra level. So now we are in the house of the Orpheum Theater and you can see what a beautiful space that it is. And uh, you know, Taylor, one of my favorite pieces and I think one of everyone's favorite pieces of the Orpheum Theater is the chandelier. What, what are some facts that you have about uh, the chandelier itself? I know for instance, that it's about 16 feet tall, if I'm, if I'm correct on that one, right? 16 feet tall and eight feet wide. You are correct, Bill. And it also has 247 lights on it and weighs 1,500 pounds. 1,500 pounds is how much that chandelier weighs. And the cool thing about the chandelier and much of the architecture and the artwork that you see up here, Ryan, correct me if I'm wrong, but a lot of this is just as old as the theater itself. Oh, most certainly, yes. Mm -hmm. And one of my favorite kind of anecdotes about the place as well is that if you look up and you always see the ceiling of the Orpheum Theater, and the ceiling itself looks amazing, but it's actually hollow. And so it's uh, suspended by cables to the actual like roof of the theater. Now, why, why is it? It's part of the architecture at the time to kind of have that plastered ceiling with the rounded edges. Um, one, to help with sound and kind of the, the architecture back then is, uh, was accustomed to that. So you can, there's enough space up there. You can actually walk on top of the ceiling um, up there. Yeah. And maybe, you know, we can save that for another time, but we might be able to kind of go up there, I think, in a future one of these digital tours that I think we'll end up doing. You'll notice this, uh, this big piece of equipment right here. We'll get to that in just a little bit. But currently, where Ryan and I are standing, if I come back to here, so where we are standing is technically part of the stage, but we call this the pit. Uh, and we call it the pit for a very specific reason. That would be because it kind of is sunken down and that's typically where the orchestra plays for most shows, um, from Broadway to opera, um, the symphony typically plays down here and um, it's adjustable on a hydraulic lift. So it can be up at stage level, it could be at house level like we are right now. And oftentimes we will um, seat the pit at that time for concerts or we can um, have it up on stage and it can be an extended apron um, if somebody wants to perform a little bit closer to the audience. So yeah. it's kind of versatile. And so you can see behind Ryan uh, is not only the Wurlitzer organ, which we'll get to in a second, but also the controls of where the lift is. And so I think we're going to go for a ride here real quick. Yeah, I'll take you down. Well, let's see just how far down this lift goes. So here we are in the normal kind of floor level. Bill, and quick question. How many seats are in the Orpheum Theater? How many seats are in the Orpheum Theater, Ryan? That would be 2,600. 2,600 seats. Wow, that's a lot down, of people. Down, down, down we go. We'll take a little pit stop here, Bill. This right here is what we call the wood level. So this is typically where um, the orchestra plays on, on this level. This is kind of the height that we determined to be a good level for the um, conductor to still be able to see what is going on on stage, but yet have it sunken down enough that you can fit a full orchestra down here. So you see the stage of the Orpheum right there. This is where most of the instrumentalists would be. Correct. But we can go a little bit lower. As you can see, that's where we were. And we continue to go down, 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 down. I believe we are reconnected. Taylor, I believe we're reconnected. Perfect. You are indeed. I was just about to come tell you. 
Oh, yeah, and I think I, I recognize that one. So we should be still good to go. But we are still in the pit of the Orpheum Theater. And this is kind of showing you where the storage space and storage area is. Correct. So we are underneath the seats right now. Um, this is where we store everything from uh, riser decks to stage curtains to speakers, um, extra stairs. Uh, we have a piano in here. Um, and this is where the organ gets stored as well. It does, yes. My favorite thing about this is like, yeah, it's just a storage space, but you're directly underneath the seats of the theater, which is always one of my favorite things about this. Yeah. And so you can say, kind of see, there's the doorway of where a lot of the uh, uh, musicians and folks would kind of come in to enter the pit stage right there. That leads to the backstage areas as well. And just to give you kind of a scale of how far down that we really are. So, I mean, this is a good, what, about 10 feet? Yeah, definitely. Absolutely. Pit moving. Thank you, Pitt. Hey, Bill, we have a question. Can you rotate your screen? Oh, yep. Yeah. Give me one second. Thank you. And then back over. That's perfect. Work. And we have a question from one of our participants. How many instrumentalists can fit on the floor level of the pit? That's a fantastic question. That is a good question. Um, we can fit a full size orchestra down here. So um, it could be probably up to 40. Mm -hmm. I would say it would be a good number, um, depending on the instrumentation. Um, we have even spilled out onto the, into the dressing rooms and mic'd them um, as well if we need to for certain shows. But just on the, uh, the orchestra level, I would say uh, about 40. Yeah, That's absolutely. Great. And I said, just saw a question of why do we need the floor to go lower? It's because we have different levels of access to different parts uh, of the rest of the Orpheum. So for instance, from the orchestra level, which we were at, gives us access to the seats and everything else. And you can kind of see uh, we're going a little bit higher than where we were. So now we go from having access to the seats and once the stage completely finishes lifting up all the way, we will have complete access and now we are part of the stage itself. So there's the first level is the stage level, then you have the orchestra level, and then you have the wood level, which is kind of where the instrumentalists will come in. And then for us to access all the storage space at the very bottom, we take it down to the very, very lowest of levels. That's about 10 feet down. And so now we are on the stage itself, as you can see. So no longer are we, uh, <laughs> if we wanted to get to the orchestra level, we would have to you know, take quite a leap down there. And uh, from here, you can kind of see what the perspective is of a performer, of what it's like to stand on the Orpheum stage and kind of see the audience is enjoying your show. This is one of my favorite views in the entire city of Omaha, really. It is great, it's yeah. one of a kind. And one of the coolest pieces as well of the Orpheum Theater is this big thing that uh, has been sitting on the stage. Ryan, what is this? This, believe it or not, is the original 1927 Wurlitzer organ. Um, so believe it or not, there is an organ, um, built in organ um, pipes and everything, built into the Orpheum, and this is how you play it here. Yeah, so this organ is as old as the Orpheum itself. It's almost 93 years old, and it is still completely functional. It basically kind of plugs into a bottom part of the stage. And a lot of people ask, okay, where are the pipes and where do they live? Uh, the pipes actually live behind the curtains on either side above the loge boxes. Yeah. So the pipes both live there and they live up there as well. And so if there was ever the opportunity to do so, and there have been in the past, yep. we can certainly, uh, you, know, we, you know, have the ability to plug in the Wurlitzer organ and play it and is still fully functional uh, even all of these years later. It is actually, we used it just last year for the Opera of Faust and they used it as part of their orchestra. So very much um, intact. Absolutely. This is one of the coolest pieces uh, of the Orpheum Theater. Taylor, do we have any other questions? We do, Bill. Um, how high up is the stage? How high up is the stage? It's about four and a half feet from the um, edge of the orchestra level. Mm -hmm. About four and a half feet. That is a fantastic question. And again, as we said earlier, we can fit about 2,600 uh, into the Orpheum itself. Now, one more quick question. When the pit is lowered to orchestra level, um, are, is there any additional seating that's ever on the pit? Yeah. Yep. We typically use that for a lot of concerts or family shows. We drop the 
pit to the orchestra level, and we can fit about an additional 54 seats on the pit itself. Absolutely. And of course, uh, though the curtains might be down, uh, the show goes on, but whenever there is a, not a show happening on the stage, we have the ghost light going. Yes, um, the ghost light kind of serves two purposes. Uh, the first is a, and foremost is safety. So of course, at the end of the night, the theater is dark, um, the house is dark, and the edge of the stage, like I said, four and a half feet is a little bit uh, high and can, can be dangerous. So we always tend to leave this ghost light, ghost light out and what that signifies one, it shows you where the edge of the stage is so you don't accidentally fall off. And two, um, it's an old theater tradition to always leave a light on in the theater to kind of ward off bad spirits. Um, so we continue in that tradition by making sure we always have a ghost light on. That's right. There's always kind of the superstition sometimes that, uh, that every theater is kind of haunted by a ghost and you have to leave the ghost light on to appease them because they like to perform as well. I even know of like certain theaters like the Palace Theater that has two seats like bolted open so that they always have a seat to sit on, right? Yeah. So it's part superstition, but also mostly and completely about safety because even when it's dark, you still need to be able to see, especially for those crew members like Ryan, when he first comes in in the morning to kind of get everything ready. If he walks into a completely yeah. pitch, black pay, uh, pitch black place, uh, it could be kind of treacherous, especially if the pit is lowered down yes, another 15 absolutely. feet. <laughs> so from here, we're going to explore uh, other parts of the stage and kind of show you stage left, backstage, and stage right. Uh, all the little elements to them and kind of how shows get loaded in. Uh, but please continue to ask any questions that you might have about uh, any of the roles that you uh, think are needed to put on a show and to work backstage at the Orkney. So I'll open this up. So now we're making our way over to stage left. And the first thing you'll notice in stage left is, uh, is some of the equipment that's over here. Ryan, what is uh, stage left normally used for for most shows? Typically stage left is kind of our audio world. Um, so currently you're looking at some of our audio equipment um, in the storage that we have for that. So this is where we keep all of our microphones, cables, um, and we can patch in to do um, uh, our patch track over there for any various microphones. Um, when a Broadway show comes in, they kind of bring their own mic and um, mic package, amplifiers, and everything. And this is kind of the world that they live in, live in. They set up on stage left. Absolutely. So there's crew members that are back here that are monitoring all the equipment, making sure that it's working properly. You have other stage hands that have to do, you know, sometimes quick uh, mic change outs. You know? Yep. So, you know, we call that position kind of an A2 position. So A1 stands for your, your primary audio person, and that's um, the person behind the audio console um, at front of house or the sound booth back there. And then we have an A2 position, which typically lives in the sound world back here when you have a lot of various microphones or changes that need to be happening. That person's job is typically to kind of wrangle that and make sure that um, that's all seamless and everything on stage uh, audio wise is working correctly because it's kind of hard for the audio person in the booth to kind of come up here and do those sort of things so we always have a second person typically for those bigger shows that's right it takes a coordinated effort people are on headsets they're mm -hmm. in different parts of the building talking to each other even something like the nhsta showcase you know we will have you know a certain amount of microphones and then we will have to change mics from performer to performer just to make yeah. sure that everyone gets heard uh, depending on what the show is and a show like that, we actually have um, an A3. So we kind of go uh, into the third ranks just in the audio department because there's so many audio changes with a full orchestra down in the pit to make sure that they can hear everything that they need to hear. And as well as getting all, all of the microphones changed over from scene to scene. So now we come to a set of doors. And you might think, well, this is just a set of doors. What does this have to do with anything? Well, first off, for scale, yeah. Ryan, how tall are you? About five foot ten, and these doors are massive. Why would we need doors this big? So what we're looking at is the loading dock here. So we have two loading docks for the Orpheum. This is where all the trucks back up, doors open, and we can unload two trucks at one time um, for any Broadway show or uh, anything else that happens. Like yeah. It might, it'll get a little loud because of the uh, the wind that's coming in, but I'll just kind of walk in for a second. And so, yeah, this is where normally the trucks would come in, you unload them one by one, and it is, a, it is a quick process in order to get a show put in. For a typical Broadway show, how long does it take to, to load in an entire Broadway production? Um, anywhere from eight to 12 hours is probably standard, and that's working nonstop. Uh, some of the bigger shows uh, would require multiple days, like a Lion King, Aladdin, a Phantom of the Opera. 
um, that could be a whole week in some cases where you're kind of consistently loading in um, 19 trucks. Um, I think uh, was the biggest one that we recently had with Aladdin. So um, it can be quite a bit. Yeah, Aladdin is is crazy in terms of the amount of trucks uh, that are needed in order to go in there. And before we get to a few more questions, we'll just kind of take the, the path and kind of walk it. It might get a little loud because the uh, HVAC system is going up to make sure the place stays cool. But right now we're taking kind of the back pathway uh, of, of the Orpheum. So kind of the, the way to get from backstage left to backstage right. Yep, we call this area the annex area. So this is can be used for a couple different things. One is primarily storage. Um, you can see this is where we have our rack full of um, lighting instruments. We store them on here. Giant racks on wheels so that we're able to move them around or move them on stage if we need to be a little bit closer to things. Um, so we use this space um, for cable and for other instruments and miscellaneous things. When shows come in, um, we can use this for road cases or sometimes for Broadway. It can also be used as a wardrobe quick change area. They'll line up their wardrobe gondolas and they will um, utilize the whole space just for quick changes. Absolutely, and this is this is definitely one of the spots that we've utilized, but I've seen, you know, from when you see the Broadway tours come through, is that that area is often kind of, you know, point number one for doing a quick change. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So now we bring us over to stage right. And on stage right, uh, we see here the fly system. And before we get to the fly system, we're gonna check out the space that's right over here, which is uh, kind of, the point with, that all stage managers uh, kind of operate out of right here. Yep, we call this uh, the stage manager console. Um, it's kind of an, an older desk that we've retrofitted to, to handle just about anything a stage manager might need. So we have um, different cue buttons, different cue buttons here with um, red, green, and blue. And they coordinate on the fly rail with um, different cues. So you turn the light on as a standby. So people on the fly rail can get by their rope and be able to pull in the scenery when the light goes off. And that kind of signals to take the cue when the light goes off. Yeah. So this is different than a lot of uh, productions I did when I was in school, both high school and college. I normally was, if, with, was within earshot mm -hmm. of the stage manager or with uh, an ASM of some type. And I could just hear them say, you know, get ready for, to pull out the fly of this rail or that spot and then they could just say go and I would go but oftentimes there's so many people operating so many different places and they could be very far away from the stage manager that they need these sort of light cues in order to do that. Certainly we use a little bit of both they are also on headset and radio as well but um, the visual cue, cue kind of helps um, coordinate and so there's no mess up when you have that many people on the rail. Mm -hmm. So we also have a monitor here that shows you what is happening on stage so there's Taylor, there's the organ, um, and then these are the seats. And then we have the comm button here. So we have the um, stage manager can talk to the lighting booth or the spot booth or um, an extra position that we have. And then of course the microphone for the backstage page. So if they need to talk to anybody in the dressing room, they can use this. And so that's the kind of cool spot here. And then of course, once we call a fly, uh, that is this huge system right here. So Ryan, give us the rundown of this, uh, this awesome area of the Orpheum Theater. Um, the fly system is kind of what makes a proscenium a theater um, so versatile and great is because what you can do is you put your curtains, your lights, your scenery um, on different pipes that we call um, battens um, or line sets. And from there, they're kind of counterweighted. So depending on how heavy the piece of equipment or whatever you're hanging, you kind of balance that with these uh, steel bricks over here so that it can go out um, with ease and you're not lifting the full weight of the scenery. So whatever the weight is, you kind of load it up. Uh, one of the heavier things that we have uh, right here is the main curtain, which is 650 pounds right here um, for our main curtain. Look at all those weights. Up. Yep. And we have 60 line sets, so we can have 60 pipes um, full of equipment of any kind. Um, at any, for any show. Nice. Do you want to give us an example of uh, pulling one of the line systems in? Certainly. Electric coming in downstage. Thank you. You might be wondering why I say thank you uh, whenever Ryan yells something out. And uh, for all of my perf performer friends out there, that is kind of a vital thing to know, especially during something like a tech rehearsal, is that when a crew member or a stage manager or anybody uh, yells out something like a, a you know a baton coming in or an electric going out. It's a 
you have to almost always say thank you to let them know that you uh, that you heard them uh, because it's a huge safety measure. Because if Ryan starts bringing this in and people aren't aware of it, uh, then someone could get hurt. And so you can kind of see there's just numerous different safety measures that uh, get taken to make sure that all of these shows operate in a safe and uh, very fun way. And so now that we've brought in one of these uh, electrics, uh, how high up do these things go? Uh, the grid itself is 65 feet. So technically this can go all the way to the grid if you would like it um, at 65 feet tall. Typically we're around 35 feet is typical for, um, for most electrics. Nice. And so this is a space where we hang all of the lights and this is kind of when a show gets uh, comes in for the very first time, it knows, you know, it has an idea of all the electrics that are in the space and it knows exactly where it needs each light where. Correct. So a lot of times when a show comes in, they'll give us paperwork in a light plot that tells us, that's very specific to the Orpheum, that tells us specifically which pipe to hang it on and where um, on the pipe to hang it on. So these little marks that you see, 32, that means it's 32 feet from center. So on the paperwork, it will tell you we need a light at 30 feet or 25 feet. Uh, and that's where we're able to put the light so that we know and the show is ready to go um, in a timely manner. And here you can see one of the electrical boxes that will connect to some of these lights. And the connections of, of these lights is usually, uh, it's not your standard uh, outlet plug that you find. Nope, uh, they're called stage pin or 2P and G. So it's kind of a um, very much a, a theater plug right there. Yeah. I saw a great question of uh, who operates the fly systems and who, you know, pulls the things in and out. And those are stagehands and they are professional stagehands. They are. So um, the Orpheum and Omaha Performing Arts, we work with a, the local union, IOTC, Local 42. Um, IOTC stands for International Alliance of Theatrical um, Employees. And what they do is they are trained profession professionals in the theatrical arts. So they know how to hang um, lights, they know how to operate the fly rail system, how to operate our sound and lighting consoles, the spotlights. Um, they really are responsible for um, the operation of just about all of the equipment, the stage equipment in this building. And you can kind of see there's, there's many different types of lights that are used and each of the lights uh, have different names, things like Source 4 and PAR and, uh, and others like that. And it really just kind of tells you the type of light uh, that it makes, uh, how focused it is, what else you can do with it. But the cool thing that you can see is that obviously they're all kind of clamped down onto the pipe for one. They kind of get screwed in and clamped that way. And then we have these extra little pieces here, this little spot safety. right here. Yep. It's a safety wire so that if for any reason uh, that clamp got loose and the light were to come off of the pipe itself, that safety line makes sure that it doesn't fall. And even more so, there's other secure uh, procedures taken with all of the cords, all of the, the battens, all of the wiring, so that all of them could basically hold much more weight than we would ever, ever, ever put on it. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Taylor, do we have any questions? We do, we have a few great questions. So how many stage managers are usually backstage during a show? Uh, well, you always have your primary stage manager, the production stage manager, who usually calls the show. Um, a lot of times it's on stage right, but for Broadway, it could very easily be on stage left as well. And that kind of depends on the traffic pattern um, or the needs of that show. From there, there could be um, anywhere from two to four additional assistant stage managers who are there on either side to make sure that actors are in places that they need to be, um, that scenery is moving on time and on cue um, as it needs to, to happen. So I would say each show is a little different depending on how big or how complex that, that is. That's great. And we also have a couple more questions about specifically about the fly system. So we have someone who goes to Waverly High School and they don't have a fly system at their school. So they're wanting to know how convenient is the system and having a fly system? It is very convenient. Um, I would say that we use it for just about every show. Um, the ability to kind of bring things in and adjust them without having to get on a ladder. Um, for, from a safety aspect, it's um, very convenient um, so that we're not lifting heavy things on ladders or um, in scissor lifts and stuff like that. We can just bring in the pipe, hang things as we need, get the appropriate counterweight balance so that it can go in and out. Um, with ease. And you'll recognize that with just about any show that comes in where 
uh, from one scene to another, it seems to be smooth or seamless. And that's typically because uh, the fly rail has a lot to do with that. Yeah, a great example of that would be in Aladdin. Uh, there's an amazing part of the show where Aladdin basically goes from, it kind of goes from the marketplace and the market square and then you kind of see the palace. The curtain comes down for a very, very brief amount of time. And then when it lifts up, you're in the Cave of Wonders. And the Cave of Wonders looks like nothing you have ever seen before. And it appears as if they had just built an entire stage in the manner of seconds. It's one of the coolest parts of, uh, of any show that I've seen that utilizes all of the fly systems and pieces. So for a show like that, sometimes you could easily see four or five um, people on the fly rail. You know, one person brings in the masking curtain and then another, you know, three other people are bringing in different pieces of the Cave of Wonder or taking things out at the same time um, to make that transition happen like magic. How, how long does that transition take? So basically the curtain comes down, actors come off and do a simple scene. And then when the curtain comes back up, the whole place uh, has a brand new set to it. How many minutes do you think that took? I would go by seconds, to seconds. be honest. Um, when you're talking something like that, uh, you bring the curtain in and oftentimes they're ready for the next scene within 30 seconds to a minute, um, depending on if there's different props and stuff like that. But the fly rail makes those changes happen really, really quick. Mm -hmm. That's great, thank you. And then one more question regarding the, the fly system. So when you were over showing us the, the fly, um, why are there two different rows of ropes? That is a very good question. So um, actually, we can head over there. I can kind sure. of explain that a little bit better. It's a great observation. Uh, when I went and stood over here, you can kind of see, yeah, there's the row of ropes over here, and then this row of ropes over here. Correct. So the row of ropes right here that I was pulling on, these these ropes are actually the ones that move the line sets, um, the pipes on stage. So you have a locking mechanism right here and the counterweight over here to lock it all in place. Um, and we have 60 of those kind of um, spaced out fairly evenly. This side is called the pin rail. So it's a little bit different than the fly rail. It's called just the pin rail because it's just rope. That's all it is. And what, it, what we use it for is it's rope on for this side and rope for the other side to typically hang cables. So you can kind of see the white rope there hanging that cable, for example. Ooh, let me get that up there, there we go. Might be hard to see, but mm -hmm. um, these ropes kind of bring the cable up and you can bring it up to the air. So you don't have excess cable on the floor typically. Um, it kind of gets cable up and out of the way so there's no tripping hazards and stuff like that. So it's like really awesome housekeeping. Yes, really, it, it comes in handy. We use it for uh, some other things too, um, but it's not counterweighted. So anything that you pull, it, you're taking the full weight of whatever you're pulling. So uh, it's typically used just for cable, but it you know, could be used for other things. Yes, because if you were to unhook this and the thing at the other end of the rope weighed more than you, yes. what would happen? You would fly up yes. because it's, it's not counterweighted. Which we don't want to ever happen, which is why we take all of the, the best safety precautions on all, anything and everything that has to do with the Orpheum Theater. Any other questions, Taylor? Do we use that system or a different system to send people up, like if they were, you know, say flying on stage or being lifted or elevated in any way? Yeah, so say we were doing Peter Pan and Peter Pan starts flying. So, uh, for example, we just had the Broadway tour of uh, Finding Neverland. That, yep. came, that had a lot of people flying around as well. How do we, how do they make them fly? Uh, well, a little secret, most often than not, it's all automated. So what they'll do is they'll hang a big truss system and they um, hook, hook the actor up and they automatically, like through a hoist and, and, and motors on the truss system, are able to fly the actor and take them on stage or off stage um, as they need it, all based on pre-programmed cues most often than not. That way the performer themselves you know, like moves in a very exact way yeah. as opposed to the human element, which is, you know, who knows what might happen yeah. if the weight system goes off in some way, shape or form. That performer might not know where they're going. Yep. yep. Time for one more question before we head down uh, downstairs to kind of show off the dressing rooms and other areas down there. Yeah, so how many people does it typically take to run a show at the Orpheum? So say a Broadway show. A Broadway show, how many people? Well, let's start with the load-in. Um, the load-in probably has the most number of people, and that could be anywhere from 80 people to 
uh, well over 100 for some of the bigger shows, all working at the same time to get things unloaded, um, set up in different places throughout the building. Um, sometimes wardrobes downstairs, people are upstairs um, in the spot booth getting things ready. Um, and of course, things are always constantly moving on stage. So it's quite um, a synchronized process once everything um, comes in. It's, uh, it's very seamless. And then once uh, the show is ready to go and it's opening night, um, some shows could have as little as probably um, eight people, um, all the way up to 24, 25 uh, working on a show. Absolutely. And that's, you know, beyond just the amount of people that work at Omaha Performing Arts. You know, yeah. we, we're in the organization and uh, if there's anything from, you, you want to talk about non-performance careers in the arts, you have, you know, production managers like Ryan, you have folks that work in the education department like myself, and of course, Taylor, there she is. Hi, Taylor. Uh, you have folks that work in facilities that make sure that every single part of our world-class facilities are working properly and in the best condition they possibly can be. You have folks in programming who are the ones who are booking the tours. They are getting the contracts. They're taking rentals. We have a, you know, a wonderful marketing department, so you can do graphic design. You can be working in PR. You can uh, make sure that you're the person that basically uh, is the traffic coordinator that knows what needs to go, when, where, and how. Uh, you have folks that work in development that help with like donations and, uh, you know, finding foundational grants. And then you have uh, folks in the executive uh, side of things, yeah. like Joan Squires, our president, who is, you know, helps us make sure that we are executing on the mission of the organization. Uh, that's just like a handful of all the different things you can do when you think about having a career in the arts. Yeah, and I should mention, um, just because on stage, you know, there could be eight or 20 people uh, working behind the scene. I was really just referring to the stagehands, but there's also a whole team of people in the front of house position from our front of house manager, the food and beverage manager, to a team of probably uh, 45 to 50 um, ambassadors um, who help get patrons seated on a nightly basis. Yeah, not to mention our ticketing folks, mm -hmm. not just the folks that like work in the box office. That's only part of their job is to work in the box office, but they're the ones making sure that all the systems are in place so that when a show like Hamilton goes on a public on sale, that we can handle tens of thousands of ticket requests in just a matter of, you know, an hour or so. Yeah. And of course, if you ever have any questions about any and everything when it comes to like careers in the arts and things of that nature, uh, that's what NHSTA is for. You know, we provide, you know, not only resources to come uh, provide adjudications for your shows, but to do master classes, to do workshops like this, and to answer any questions you have about doing a career in the arts, no matter what that is. Any other questions before we head on down? No? Cool. So now what we're going to do is uh, we're going to make our way down to the production office. So that's kind of the office where kind of Ryan works out of, but also there's a, some really cool things on the walls there that we wanted to show you. And then we'll kind of mosey our way down to where the, um, the dressing rooms are. And then from the dressing rooms, we can kind of take you down to the lower levels of the Orpheum Theater and then kind of show you, you know, some of the secret hallways that are back there. Now there's a chance that the connection might get a little funky and drop out. Uh, if that does happen, it'll probably come right back in. So don't worry about that. And, uh, you know, Taylor, as always, will kind of be there to continue to take questions and even ask questions of you. So now we're going to go down to the production. So we had a question and it was what kind of shows are typically performed at the Orpheum? Well, currently we have shows such as Broadway, dance, um, we have some rental shows, um, so some co-pros that come and they perform here, um, and we have the opera as well, and the opera Omaha is the main tenant of the Orpheum Theater, um, but they come in and, and perform wonderful, wonderful performances, um, and before the Orpheum Theater um, had Broadway and dance and opera. It was a vaudeville house and then a movie theater before. And now we are in the production office. So the production office here, you can kind of see the big stage right spot. Yeah, someone was like, rent, yes, absolutely. <laughs> There's all of the cool things, but here's the, one of my favorite parts of this office is that it is filled and it kind of constantly changes with posters of shows that have performed right here at the Orpheum. What's some of your favorites, Ryan? Um, I gotta go with uh, Wicked was, is, is a great one, and The Lion King, um, and Mary Poppins is probably one of 
absolutely warhorse which you see up there i think it was one of my all-time favorites and then recently one of my favorites was the play that goes wrong it's one of the funniest shows i have ever seen and my favorite thing about all of these posters is that they are autographed by the casts of the tour after they finish so you can kind of see there's phantom just had the illusionists and stop there's a bronx tale of course hamilton's right down there as well Miss Saigon, come from away. It's one of the coolest parts of the Orpheum that I don't think uh, a lot of people get to see because they're never, uh, they're never backstage. So, you know. You this get, is really just a, a handful um, of, of selected ones, but we have posters dating all the way back to uh, probably the eighties, but we kind of rotate them in and out um, just to kind of mix things up a little bit. Yeah. So there's a level up there that people work out of and they come down and, this sometimes is just a check-in area if there's any kind of paperwork or things that need to be, uh, that need to be done in that side. And then from there, uh, you can kind of see that is where we just came from, where you would go up those steps and onto the Orpheum stage, that's stage right. And then from down here, you can kind of see those double doors, that is the stage door. And so that's where all the performers enter in, that's where all the crew members come in from. That's where they enter into. And of course, the first thing that any performer sees is, uh, you know, the very simple, uh, bulletin board, but why is this board so important? This is the call board. So I'm sure anybody in theater is familiar with the term call board. Um, this is where you'll check in, or actors check in, crew check in. It lists um, information about, um, for touring shows anyway, it lists information about what hotel room they're staying in, what uh, other activities are going on in the city, um, specific information for the shows in Omaha. Mm. So from here, we can kind of see where the stage door goes. And now we hope the connection will stay stable as we kind of mosey our way down. So now we are going to the dressing rooms. And this is where all of the performers and all the touring shows, this is where they will operate out of. Uh, everyone kind of gets ready for, their, for the performance and does their makeup and everything else in all of the rooms that are down here. Now there's obviously quick change stations up on the stage itself, but uh, parts of the stage here, or everything you see down here, can fit uh, a huge number of performers down there. I mean, how big are some of the casts that have to use all these dressing rooms? They will use every single space that we give them. So uh, they will put anywhere from um, two people to a dressing room in some of these smaller rooms, such as this one. Um, I can go ahead and... So full mirror, lights, um, kind of a dressing room setup. Uh, some of the bigger dressing rooms, we could easily have 12 to 15 in them. Absolutely. And so the hallway here, uh, you know, it goes all the way down. There's dressing rooms all the way through there. There's the, the green room, the Henry Fonda room. There's a lot of the uh, engineering spots down there. But the dressing rooms don't stop there. They also go all the way down here. Now, Bill, you were just, you said something about a green room. What's that? So the green room is kind of the area where a lot of performers will come uh, when it's before the show, if they need to uh, you know, do any pre-show activity, if they need to have dinner, if they need to relax. Uh, yeah. It's used for any number of reasons if they don't want to be in the dressing room. I was going to say, since the dressing rooms can be um, quite full sometimes or people are getting dressed or getting ready and you kind of need that separate space to, like Bill said, have dinner or um, work on something else, work on your computer, the green room is kind of a separate a shared space for everybody to do those sort of things outside the dressing rooms. So the Henry Fonda room is one of the green rooms. We just call it the Henry Fonda room. Uh, it's kind of an homage to Henry Fonda, who is one of the most uh, famous actors in the history of Nebraska. Yep. So now we're even in a lower part of the Orpheum, and this is where there are more dressing rooms. So this is dressing room M. So this is often a dressing room that can fit a lot more people and will normally have folks, uh, you know, like ensemble members and a lot of the, the folks from like, the, if there's any big group numbers, a lot of those folks will be down here. It absolutely is. How many dressing rooms in total do we have? We have 12. 12. And of course, if we get hungry, there's catering. And that goes all the way down into there. That's probably the lowest part of the Orpheum Theater uh, in a lot of ways. And the thing is, is that the dressing rooms keep going and going and going. How many people can you fit? I don't, uh, Taylor, what was that question? 
that question was how many people total can you fit in all of the dressing rooms? I don't have a total number, but I would easily say um, 80 to 100. Yeah, I mean, in a safe manner, 80 yeah. to 100. Yes, yeah. we have to obey fire codes. <laughs> I was going to say, there's limitations. Yes. Uh, could you do more? Probably. Would it be safe? No. So now we go all the way at the end of that hallway, and that brings us out to the lower lobby. So we're directly under the grand lobby where we started. There's Ryan and I everybody. And from this grand lobby, there are extra restrooms, many other spots. These restrooms are kind of my, my secret go-to restrooms. They are. They're, fun fact, they are much larger than the ones that you will find on orchestra level, which tend to get um, pretty busy uh, right away. So if you Need to go, I would run downstairs as quickly as you can. That is your pro tip for the next time you come yes. to the Orpheum Theater. When the curtain rises back up and we come back from this interlude, you will see a show, hit up the downstairs bathrooms. Yes. There's your pro tip for the day. So now we're in what's called the fireplace lobby for obvious reasons. There's a nice fireplace that's right down here. It's kind of a, an extra kind of lobby exhibition space where you can have small events. And from here, we will go back up the steps and this takes us back into the main lobby. Now, while we're transitioning back into the main lobby, someone had a question of, do performers go all the way down to the dressing rooms for costume changes and or makeup touch-ups? And the question, uh, the answer for that question is sometimes, if they have enough time between their scenes, they can go down and touch up makeup or, or change their costume. But we do have places backstage where if they need to make a quick change, they can do that very easily. That's the fanciest water fountain I've ever seen. Uh, it is the fanciest water fountain that I have ever seen. And the cool thing about those water fountains, those they're made out of their terracotta water fountains. And the cool thing about those water fountains is that those water fountains are as old as the Orpheum itself. Those are 93 year old uh, water fountains, which is very, very, it's one of my favorite like little pieces of trivia about the Orpheum Theater. So now we're back to the stage and we'll head up back to the stage and we can continue to take any other questions that you might have before we wrap up for the day. It is really old. Uh, the Orpheum Theater itself, was built in 1927. And so many pieces of the theater uh, are just as old as that uh, since 1927. In fact, not, not many things here, Ryan, are pretty new. No, uh, we always consistently try to update things that are get worn and torn, um, such as the, we recently did all the seats and the carpet in the Orpheum just a couple years ago. Um, but the Orpheum itself, we try to keep as authentic as possible. So from here, we can even kind of show where we enter the stage itself from here. And we come back up to stage right. Electric going out. Thank you. And there it goes. And that kind of is the general tour of the Orpheum Theater. Um, but we still have time uh, for a few questions uh, about anything about non-performance careers in the arts or other pieces about the Orpheum. Taylor, what else do we have? We have several questions right now. Um, one of them is how often do you professionally check? So how often do we professionally check our safety precautions? Uh, certainly once a year. Um, as far as a general inspection, when we have a third party rigging inspection come out and they'll test, um, they'll go through the whole building to make sure that we are in compliance and um, meeting that safety standard or exceeding that. But of course, on a daily or show basis, we always try to check um, whether that's the genie lift or um, different set pieces that come in, making sure that everything that we're touching and handling is operated safely. Yeah, the, the genie lift and I remember uh, the magic carpet uh, mm -hmm. in Aladdin, you know, we, we have every last part of the Orpheum tested for safety, but even the shows when they come in do all of their own safety checks. Yeah. So when the magic carpet comes in, the magic carpet for Aladdin is how much? Uh, probably at least 12 to 15,000 pounds. Yeah, 12 to 15,000 pounds. That's how much the magic carpet weighs. 
And so when they first come in and load in that show, part of that loading is testing out that magic carpet moving and making sure everything is safe and secure as possible. And if for any reason they have even an inkling that it might be just the slightest bit unsafe, they will take any precautions that they have, including, uh, you know, reinforcing places in theaters that need reinforcement and any of that kind of stuff. Yeah. yeah. What other questions do we have? Let's see. How many people does it take to run the lights during different shows? Um, to run the lights, one person, <laughs> because you're relying on the um, the light the lighting board itself. So you you pre-program cues, and and one person is um, essentially just pressing go onto the next cue and next cue. But before that, it takes uh, a handful of people. Um, so the lights that we saw on that baton to hang that. It could be, you know, eight to 12 people, depending on how many different lights or the setup that is required. Um, looking at the paper, paperwork, to make sure that lights are hung correctly, get the lights out of storage, do the cabling, tie everything off, make sure that everything is safe. Um, it's a, it's definitely a team effort. Yeah, and even, you know, if you look behind us all the way at the back of the theater is also, you know, spotlights and we have spot ops that need to work out there as well. Yep, so some shows that uh, utilize our spotlights, we have three in-house. Um, they operate way in the back there that kind of open window um, back there is our spotlight booth and they can um, operate all the way back there mm -hmm. and about how much does each light weigh that's, that's a good question i'm trying to think last time i looked it up as source four i'd say 20 pounds i would say 20 to 25 yeah yeah i think that, i don't think i've ever worked with a light that's been no, they're so not heavy lights. that I, yeah, so heavy that I haven't been able to lift it up, but yeah, they are not. Uh, light when, when you're doing, you know, it could easily be a hundred for like an opera. It could be in the two to 300, 200 light fixtures for just one show. Yeah, they're called lights, but they're not very light. No. Um, how does a person hang up lights on the stage for shows? So oh, that's, that's a very good question. So how do we hang up lights on the stage for shows? So a little bit earlier, you saw Ryan bring that uh, electric baton down, that huge, big metal bar that has a bunch of lights placed on it. And so those lights are just placed in a neutral position right now. But uh, when a show comes in and we have what's called uh, kind of the light diagram, the light plot is kind of like, looks like a blueprint that has all different symbols and objects that tells us where every single light needs to go, what type of barrel needs to be put on it, any specific types of coloring or gel that changes the color of the lights. Uh, all of that is in that light plot. And that's when the load-in happens is when we're bringing battens in and out, they're going up and down, and all of those crew workers are putting different lights on different battens at different points, uh, all to make sure that it's done in a way that is right for the show. Yeah. yeah. And the a key important part about that when you're designing a show, and for the crew members as well, is that when you're adding and removing lights, you're adding and removing weight. So whatever gets added or taken off of, of the, the electric itself, we need to make sure that the counterweight system is also matched with that baton as well. Yep, so the electrics department is working hand in hand with the people on the fly rail to make sure that the weight is always within balance because the last thing you want is an out of, out of weight baton because if you take things off without doing um, the weight on the fly rail, the, the baton will just fly out and that becomes a dangerous situation. Absolutely. So. How long does it take to focus all of the lights for a show? That's a great question. Uh, it depends on the number of um, light fixtures, I would say most often than not, um, and the style that it needs to be in, if it's very specific or if it's just a general wash. But um, for a dance show, for example, it could easily be in eight hours, eight hours of consistent focus. Yeah, that's, that's what tech rehearsal is for. Mm -hmm. uh, and even if it's whether or not you're just doing a tech rehearsal for a show that you're putting on, or you need to have complete tech for a show that's just coming in for a Broadway tour. Uh, it depends on the amounts and uh, what's needed for the show, but it can take a lot of hours to make sure all the lights are focused and put exactly where they need to be. Now, early you were talking a little bit about the union. Can you talk a little bit more about the Stagehands Union and what it takes to join? Certainly. Um, so as we mentioned, um, the stagehand union that we work with and is the stagehand union for Omaha uh, is IOPSI Local 42. Um, they're a great group of people that are very skilled and knowledgeable um, in the theater arts. Um, to be a stagehand, um, you kind of go through um, a little bit of a, um, it's called an apprenticeship program. So where you learn some of the basics um, of the stagehand craft from more senior members of the group, and then you become a, um, 
you start as a casual. So you get put on different show calls like a Broadway where you need 100 people. It's, um, you get to join in there and then you can help learn um, how a show goes in and how a show gets loaded out. And then as you kind of work your way up in seniority a little bit, you kind of get on more and more calls and become um, a little bit more versatile in your skills as a stagehand. Mm -hmm. But there's, you know, uh, being a stagehand, if you're interested in being a stagehand as well, uh, you know, IATC, I think, has a website, yep. especially the IATC 42, where you can learn all about it. And, uh, you know, there's, I don't, I don't know many stagehands that, you know, wouldn't relish the opportunity to inform people about yep. what it is that they do and to bring more people into the fold. Absolutely. And I should also mention the, um, the Omaha Community Playhouse, along with um, Metro Community College, has an apprenticeship program um, for backstage um, skills. And a lot of people in the union um, have been a part of that apprenticeship program through the Playhouse uh, and then have kind of jumped on board with the Stagehand Union and have done um, uh, bigger shows, whether it's the Broadway here or concerts at the um, CHI Center as well. So mm -hmm. it's kind of a transition uh, or a good place to start as well. Yeah. I saw a question about what a, a dance show is and what, what we mean by a dance show. And that's a great question. So we can talk about something that's like a Broadway musical that is, you know, a musical theater designed to be performed in song. And some musical theater pieces are very dance focused. But when we say a dance show, we mean something like uh, if the Moscow uh, Festival Ballet came in or Santa Fe Ballet or Ailey 2 uh, or any of those, you know, really awesome uh, contemporary dance groups as well. That's what we mean by a dance show. And normally it's a very, you know, sparse stage, but what one of the things that is very important for those shows is the lighting for the show. And even for those shows, that's interesting because uh, offstage left and offstage right are actually huge racks of lights that get added to a show for a lot more direct side lighting. Yeah, I would say the dance series, um, those types of shows are very lighting centric and they're, um, they're very precise in how things are focused um, and kind of different angles. It's all about the angles typically um, to kind of create different looks for those pieces. So they typically tend to be a little, um, um, a little more time consuming on the lighting side of things um, for those types of shows. Yeah. We have time for a couple more. Perfect. Um, let's see. What is one of the biggest shows we have had here? Biggest in terms of, uh, let's, let's do both. Let's do biggest in terms of, uh, amount of tickets sold, like the amount of people, but also biggest in terms of what it took to load that show in. Like the biggest amount of trucks, crew, you know, that kind of thing. Let's start there. Um, the biggest show as far as ticket sales, I would believe, would be Lion King the last time that it was here in 2013. Mm -hmm. um, I think they did a four-week run then, and they sold out just about every performance for that, that run. Um, so much so that Disney gave us um, an actual lion mask to hang up in the lobby out there um, because we, we outdid projections that well. Yeah, the lion mask itself we did not see because we're doing some uh, cleaning and re renovations in the uh, Orpheum lobby. But next time uh, that you walk into the grand lobby, look at those pillars and you'll be able to see, uh, I think it's a Simba mask yes. is what it is there. And what about in terms of amount of trucks, amount of crew, what are some of the biggest shows that you Mm, I would also say that Lion King takes the crown for that one as well. Um, as far as the biggest show, technically, um, I believe they do 22 trucks full of semi trucks full of equipment um, that come in and they'll take uh, three or four days to load before the first opening night to load all that stuff in. 22 which, semi trucks. Yeah, it's a lot. Um, it is definitely a lot. Yeah. But yeah. Some other notable big ones would be uh, Aladdin was also very big at 19 trucks. Um, and Phantom of the Opera is another very large one. Cool. What else? Um, how many shows do we have at the Orpheum in one year? So a great question on that one is how many shows do we have at the Orpheum in a year? And I, I'm actually going to pose that to the chat and not only just the Orpheum, let's do both of the Omaha performing arts spaces. So let's do the Orpheum and we'll do the Holland Center. So the Holland Performing Arts Center, which is uh, down over on 12th and Douglas. So between those two venues, they have about three performance spaces. You have the, uh, the stage here at the Orpheum, you have the Kiewit Concert Hall, and you have the Scott Recital Hall. And there's a few, like we have the Courtyard Well as well and things like that. So between those two performance spaces in 365 days, how many events, performances, things of that nature, how many events do you think we have per year? I want you to put your guess in the chat. I'll have to think about that one 42 too. over 100. 
another guess. What other guesses do we have coming in for that one? 78, 74, 45 or 75. I like Very that. Very specific. <laughs> 65, 73, great. So uh, in about 365 days, I would say we have over 450 events a year. I was going to say, it is, it is definitely uh, over 400. Yeah. So you're, you're talking, there are some days where there are three shows happening all at the same time. So there is going to be a Broadway tour on this stage. There is going to be uh, a concert in the concert hall. We'll have a 1200 club jazz series happening in the, uh, in the Scott recital hall. Uh, and then who knows what's happening in the lobbies or if we have an event in the courtyard and then add on to that, like all of those performances, you have anything that are, uh, cohort partners, you know, folks like the Omaha Symphony and Opera Omaha, who are great organizations that are separate from us, but they use the space. Then you have add weddings on yeah. top of it, add dance uh, recitals, add anything else that you can imagine. All of those things uh, need to be rented from us or we pay to bring them in or they come through as a Broadway tour or any of that kind of stuff. So think about all of the, the crew people. All the production people, they're not just working on the Broadway shows. They're working on every single one of those 450 plus events every single year. That is a lot of show. <laughs> it's time for one last question. One last question. All right, let's go with, let's go with this one because I think it kind of ties everything together. Um, what or who inspires you to do what you do every day? Nice. Brian, we'll start with you. I think it's just the arts in general. Um, I love opening night or um, it's showtime. You know, you put in your hard work advancing the show, getting things loaded in, set up, ready to go. Um, but it's not until you actually kind of peek your head out into the crowd and you ever see everybody, the anticipation, everybody's waiting for the show to start and um, just the joy that you see on their face. You kind of like, it's, it's just fun to see every night. Um, mm -hmm. Just to kind of peek out there, see the, all the seats kind of full and Participate in that, I think, uh, is a lot of fun, and that's why I like doing what I do. Yeah. Uh, what inspires me would be that, uh, you know, when I first got it started, I started doing theater when I was in high school, and I enjoyed performing, and I still love performing to this day. You know, I'm a, a union stage actor and things of that nature. Um, and so it starts on that, that drive, that love of storytelling, because it's one of the, you know, one of the greatest things that anybody can do is be a great storyteller. And then uh, as I got older and I learned about all the different things you can do in the theater industry, uh, I immediately wanted to try everything and learn everything because uh, anywhere that I could make something on this stage happen was something that I wanted to be a part of. And so that's where I found uh, where I'm at now working in the education department and coming up with uh, great events and great programs like Nebraska High School Theater Academy or Disney musicals in schools or musical explorers. But even when sometimes when life throws you a curveball coming up with digital programs like this tour, right? It's, it's stuff that's, uh, putting stuff like this together is stuff that only, I think, uh, you know, theater people, yeah. the arts people can do. Uh, and it, it inspires me because of folks like you that came to this. This is our very first digital workshop and are participating and chatting along. Uh, that's, that inspires us just as well. Right. And so that's gonna wrap it up for this workshop. Uh, Ryan, myself, Taylor, everybody at Omaha Performing Arts wants to thank you uh, for attending this. Uh, also, just let us know uh, what you thought of this workshop, how everything went. You should get like a little survey at the end of this to let, uh, to let us know how everything went. Uh, but also, you know, let us know on, on Facebook or uh, go to uh, o-pa.org. That's the Omaha Performing Arts website. And uh, while you're there, when you go to the Omaha Performing Arts website, Check out everything uh, that is coming with the digital programming that we're doing. You can see uh, a lot of the shows that will be coming up because these curtains will stay up and we will have shows again. You can also check out our donation page if you feel like directly supporting uh, not just you know, the organization of Omaha Performing Arts, but the education department as well, anything like that as well. Uh, and you know, I think we'll leave it at, at one kind of last, last note about this. And that is kind of, you can see uh, the ghost light where it stands. You can also see all the seats out here. The theater is gorgeous, but it's meant to have people in it. And while the times right now might not allow us to have folks in here right now, we cannot wait to have you back in this space. We cannot wait to have some shows here. And we, uh, we very much look forward to the day when we can see you back here. And that day will happen soon. And as we say, the curtain will never close. It's just an interlude. And so 
this is part one of many parts of digital things, but in the very near future, we'll all have the opportunity to sit in this audience and enjoy a show again. So on behalf of everybody at Omaha Performing Arts, we'll keep the ghost light on and have a great rest of your week, everybody. Thanks.